Welcome to Masters of Risk, the podcast where we uncover what is top of mind for business leaders today. I'm Yashi Adab, and I will be your host every month. Let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Masters of Risk, a podcast hosted by S&P Global Market Intelligence. My name is Yashia Dov, and joining me today is Jennifer Reynolds, who is currently the CEO of Women's Corporate Directors Foundation, along with being a corporate board member. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for joining us today. I'm delighted to be here. So I'm really excited about a couple of the different topics that we are going to be touching on today. I think what would be really great for our listeners, if you could just go ahead and kick us off by giving us a little bit of a background in terms of your journey within this industry, some of the different roles and responsibilities that you've held, anything else that may be of interest. I've been in the financial services industry now for 25 years. Most of my uh, experience was in the capital markets. I started off for a couple of years in global risk management and then uh, moved into investment banking for about 12 years. And covered a pretty broad cross-section of industries, but then later in in my tenure, focused in on the technology industry. And so that led me actually to a role in the venture capital industry for a couple of years, spent some time there. And then my career took a bit of a twist in that I was asked to run an organization called Women in Capital Markets, which is Canada's largest network of women in financial services. Clearly coming from the capital markets, not a lot of women there, so it was a problem in the industry. And so was going to get the opportunity to really try to work on that issue, attract women to the industry, ensure that they were rising up into leadership roles. It turned out to be really, you know, it was a not-for-profit, so very, very different from working in the capital markets for a large global bank. I always tell people my timing was fortuitous, I think. that's I started that role in 2013, and there really was a growing focus, finally, on making progress on this and really trying to craft the nut of trying to get better gender diversity. And we were getting much better engagement from men in the industry on the topic as well. So spent almost five years there. Uh, did a lot of work at that point, too, around um, women on boards because uh, Canada was just introducing diversity disclosure for their public, uh, publicly traded companies. So uh, really got involved in that movement uh, as well. Uh, I then moved on to um, an international role representing Canada's financial services sector internationally at various networks and tables and promoting our financial center and trying to create collaboration between different financial centers around the world. And during that time, I was also starting to uh, serve on corporate boards. And then along came um, a call, the Women Corporate Directors Foundation, which is a unique organization. It's 2,500 women corporate directors around the world, about half in the U.S., and the rest spread over five continents. And uh, it uh, focuses on, clearly, diversity on boards, but corporate education, ensuring we are helping our mm-hmm. directors to be the best directors they can be leaders in corporate governance, and then obviously as well to provide a network, a trusted network uh, for these women. So for me, it was a bit of a great um, cross-section of many things that I had been working on in terms of diversity, the work I'd done diversity, in terms of my career that was then, you know, sort of going into that career of corporate director in a very international organization and really enjoyed my prior role working on a more international stage. So it's been very interesting. And I've been in the role now for about a year and a half and uh, certainly an interesting organization with some absolutely fabulous women in it. That's amazing to hear. I think just taking into uh, consideration all of the different sort of segments and landscape within the capital markets that you've worked in, I just starting to unpack your backstory. I'd love to begin with getting a bit more of an understanding on your experiences of the different risks that exist based on the role or function that you held, right? So what was it like when you were, what were some of the key risks when you were working on more of a international stage versus when maybe you were sitting on a board or working at a venture capital firm or a bank? I know those are a lot of different questions to address, but even if you could give us a little bit of a compare and contrast type of color around that. I'll talk first of all about the different roles that I've held within the capital markets because the perspective on risk has been very, very different. I started off in risk, as I mentioned earlier. So that clearly 
you've got a certain perspective there, right? When you're sitting in, in the risk seat and you're, you're the one who's mm-hmm. evaluating the credit risk and deciding, deciding whether you want to extend capital. And then moving to investment making, it's a different lens, right? You want to get deals done. You want to bring capital to your clients. Mm-hmm. You know, your tolerance for risk is obviously higher than when you're sitting on the risk side of the table. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I was working for very large corporations, right? So you've had a lot of data to analyze. You, you were making educated educating guesses or, you know, guesses maybe isn't the best word, but, you know, you were, you understood the company, you understood the financials. That's very different when you go then to venture capital, because venture capital is a whole different animal in terms of evaluating risk, right? It really is about evaluating a person um, as much as a business idea. That entrepreneur in front of you, they're going to make or break it. Sure, the idea has to be great, um, but you don't generally, um, if it's earlier stage, have a lot of financials to go on. And even if it's a little bit later stage, it's still, you know, taking that leap from tiny startup to scaling something is clearly so many risks come in there. Um, but again, I think so much about the entrepreneur, about the team, as well as the idea. So again, very different perspective on risk. The one sort of overarching comment, though, just to broaden out based on your question is, when I was in risk, I'm going back now to, I'm going to date myself. It was ni- 1998 to 2000 is when I sat in that seat. Uh-huh. And it was a, that's a very different time. When you think about the types of risk that we were looking at, they were really financial, obviously very financial focus, legal focus, things like that. But today risk is just so much broader. I mean, the risk that we're looking at as managers of business and as board directors, clearly, as you know, that delves now into the environment, into the social issues. Now, those things worked on the table in the same way back then. So now right. you know, it's much more complex. If you think about supply chain, much more complex. You think about geopolitical environment, much more complex. So I think as a director and as managers of businesses, this is a very different time. And risk has come to mean something very different today than it did in the past. I think that completely makes sense. And even just thinking about that timeline, right? I mean, since 2000, just in the last two decades, we've had the financial crisis, the housing crisis. We've just went through a pandemic a few years ago, the repercussions of which we're still experiencing today. So keeping that in mind, I would be curious if you, what was your experience like during that the crisis of 08, 09? And how did your perspective in terms of how you approached your risk-focused roles or not even just financial risk, but even from a human capital standpoint or reputational standpoint, what were some things that, what were some storms that you weathered and how they've influenced the way that you approach your leadership roles today? Well, I think if you think of it 08, 09, that's a very different beast, right, than than COVID. Yeah. I, I would argue it was a self-created crisis by the financial services industry. Um, and yeah, but that certainly shaped, those of us who went through that, that shaped our perspectives for the future. There's no doubt about it. I'd like to think some of us maybe got smarter, but thinking about the risks and thinking about groupthink, um, yeah. I think that whole crisis would argue that there wasn't enough diversity at the table, diversity of thought, and diversity of perspectives, and there wasn't enough focus on the risks that we were just talking about. It needed a different solution than COVID. You move to COVID and, and pandemic. I mean, that was an incredibly... Uh, challenging time for everybody, for the financial services sector, for, you know, in terms of trying to support the economy and and governments and the financial services sector working much more closely together to try to get us through this thing. So I think that was an interesting time. And I was running Toronto Finance International at that point. So I had the opportunity to not only have a lens into what was happening in Canada between our financial services sector and the government and the different mechanisms that they, we were using to support the economy and people through that period. I was involved with several, two specifically international networks of financial centers. And so over that period, we were also meeting and I was getting a lens into what is France doing? What is the UK doing? What are different countries around the world doing to get through this crisis from a financial perspective and to support their economy and to support people? So I think that was actually extremely valuable because we were able to meet in those international forums and then bring that back to the table in our own countries and talk about the different mechanisms people were using and potentially consider them for our own country 
to think about. That's a great over idea they've developed over there. Why don't we use that here? So, and that's the benefit of those international networks, right? It really is to be able to, it's not always about competition between financial centers. There's a lot of times where collaboration is really important. I can definitely agree there. And so would you be able to maybe share with us an example where you were in this collaborative environment and someone brought to the table or brought forth an idea that you did take back to the Canadian financial services industry and you saw the success story of taking a concept, bringing it to your more, bringing it more local and then watching it take off? Yeah, I'll talk about another um, international network that I was a part of. I co-chair for a period of time and it's a, a UN convened network of financial centers. It's called uh, okay. Financial Centers for S Sustainability. And so it started in, in 2017 when I just uh, went into the CEO role with um, Toronto Finance International. And it at the time, there were seven countries, seven financial centers who uh, had representatives like myself and, and got together at the bequest of, of, of the UN to talk about, it, was there a need for a network of financial centers focusing on how do we build capacity in the sustainable finance market? How do we drive capital from the private sector into all the very important work we need to do to meet meet our climate goals. And so there was a lot of interest in it. And so it ended up building to now 42 countries uh, from around the world. And so I think, wow, the importance of that we found was that it really was everybody has a thirst to try to figure this out, right? How do we get capital into the right projects? How do we really have an impact so that we are meeting our climate goals? And and we know we can't do it fast enough, right? So we don't want to all just be in our own corners trying to figure this out on our own. We all understood we have to get together uh, to speed up the velocity of how we're tackling these problems. I think there were just so many cases that came up in that network. We did, whether it was different thoughts on, maybe this doesn't sound to be the most exciting thing, but taxonomy, right? Like how mm -hmm. do you talk about your climate? What is green, right? And different countries around the world were at different places. You're clearly much further ahead than other countries. So by being able to look and see what are they doing on that front, we could bring that back to Canada and say, okay, this is how Europe's approaching it. This is how different countries are approaching these different elements that we need to figure out and bring those learnings back and really speed up the process. And so I think certainly in the case of Canada, I think being able to look to see what other people were doing uh, allowed us to move more quickly and, and increase our knowledge about you know what needed to be done and also bring you know, best practices back to Canada. And that's not to say we figured it out, nor is anyone at this stage. But I think those types of collaboration um, on, on many fronts, but in particular, when we think about sustainability and climate goals in particular, I think we really need to leverage what's happening, good work that's happening around the world and not try and do everything on a bespoke kind of solution. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. I know that climate and sustainability has been a huge focus here in the States. Um, especially recently, given kind of all of the challenges that we've been facing over the last few years and all of the research and data that's been coming out, um, we're finally starting to follow some of our European colleagues. So, Jennifer, something that I'd like to almost pivot into a little bit now is when we were talking about your experience with risk and the economy and kind of the different areas that you have your experience in, I'd love to dive into the concept of capital allocation and your opinions around that, how, what you've seen in terms of how capital has historically been allocated, how, what are some changes that you'd like to see or have seen, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, and it's a really important topic, obviously, from a number of different perspectives. We could talk about, if you're thinking about the E, the environment, climate, how do we make sure that capital is going into those types of projects and that they're getting the attention that they need? I think the other perspective you can think about is who's getting the capital. And really right. with my background, I think a lot about women in the economy. And we know that women aren't getting the capital, the VC world. That's just a reality, right? Uh, the yeah, percentage of capital that goes yeah, it's very unfortunate. The percentage of capital that goes to women is just so low. And that's not because women don't have good ideas. I mean, I sat in those chairs and, and had people come in the door and pitch their business, their idea. And unfortunately, we didn't see a lot of women come in the door. And I think that's not that there weren't women entrepreneurs out there. I just think that they weren't even making it in the room because they didn't have the right networks, right? It's how do you even get in the room with people is question yep. number one. 
And I think a lot of underrepresented groups, not just women, have that exact problem. They don't have the network. And so they can't even get in the room to pitch the right people. And then when they get in the room, you don't see anyone who looks like you. And the people who you're across the table from probably are fairly similar. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> and so do they understand sort of some of the problems you're trying to attack but, and your perspective that you're bringing to the table? So I think it was almost sometimes I felt like they were speaking a different language than the people the people they were across the table from. And so that was a difficult um, situation for me to be in as a woman to just see that disconnect between, you know, an entrepreneur who has a great idea, but just perhaps can't be understood because we need more diversity at the table. We need other people who have different perspectives and are going to come at problems from different ways. So I think that is a huge problem in how capital, in, in venture capital industry, for sure, no, no doubt about, it, continues to be a huge problem. And I think from a, then you go up the food chain a bit and you think about larger banks even. We know that even in those, some banks have very concerted efforts to try to make sure that they are getting capital loans out to women. But we know historically it has been very challenging, more challenging for women to access capital, even from the banking sector. So I think, and, and underrepresented groups as well, just those who, again, yeah, are comfortable exactly. perhaps with the language of banking, right? They didn't grow up in financial services like we did. So it's, I think that's something we really need to think about. It's part of it is the whole question of diversity, right? Diversity of thought and making sure that we're including everybody in that allocation of capital and in, in a fair way and uh, making sure that great ideas are getting funded, not just the ones that come from the same type of person, right? And from that same network all the time. No, I'm, I completely agree with that school of thought. And I think that some of the work that's being done at women's corporate directors, for example, is a starting point in terms of bringing those voices to the table and almost even providing mentorship to help inspire confidence in women to go out and actually pursue those opportunities, pursue the funding or whatever it might be to bring their concept right to fruition. I would love to know if you could share a little bit in terms of how women's corporate directors is doing that today and also other avenues that could potentially be leveraged as a starting point? Yeah, I think I always say to people, the magic of women corporate director is the network. It, that's the glue that keeps everyone together. And that's what makes it's, it's the special thing about us because it, it created, you know, that network for women, right? That network of powerful women. These are women who are on boards, um, have had success in their career. And by pulling them all together, that there's an immense amount of influence that you can wield when you get all those people into a room. And some of that happens at the local level, city by city, you've created strong networks around the world. And that does provide, it provides opportunities because then all of a sudden, you know, when a, you know, a director role comes up, all of a sudden that group of women has a big uh, network to, to draw upon and bring those women into those opportunities. And I think that goes for business opportunities as well, right? That network is helping to pull each other up and pull more and more women into the network and empower women in their economies locally and, and then obviously broadly on a national level and even on an international level. So, and we see that collaboration happens between countries within the WCD network and provides opportunities outside your own borders and opportunities, business opportunities, director opportunities. So I think that is, it's really important. And I think that's why we are different from, I mean, you can go and get corporate governance education in a lot of different places, right? You're not going to get this network. And so that's really the unique thing. And I think it is really important to create these networks. I was just a bit of a separate note, but I was just at um, a UN event and it was focused on the lack of influence women wield within their cities, both from an economic perspective and the fact that they're not, they're only 5% of mayors around the world are women. So they don't, oh, from a wow. political perspective. Yeah. And cities have a massive influence, right? Like on our lives, like on transportation, on healthcare, yeah, absolutely. You know, the general environment, right? So right. it's just the, the goal of that whole meeting, again, was collaboration, bringing people together from around the world and sort of thinking about great ideas and how we can really, you know, rise up together and pull each other up in, in both the economy and in that case within our cities as well. So I think it's, we still need these types of networks. It's really, really important. Yeah. And I think continuing to expand them, to your point, is also something in terms of what we should be focusing on. Now, obviously, I think 
with the women component, the diversity component, that definitely is a huge factor for how to continue making progress over the longer term and almost how to diminish some of the risks that are present at a large corporation or a bank. In addition to that component, what are some other areas um, of risk maybe that you think are not being focused on or not um, that are almost hiding in the shadows somewhere that we're not looking or aren't realizing um, today but could you know come to be a much larger issue down the road yeah I, I think it, when you think about the whole diversity front not just gender diversity but broader diversity there it has been a lot of work being done and all of a sudden everybody hired a diversity officer and built teams around their diversity efforts. And, and that's all really important. I'm not making fun of it. I think it's it, it, a very important part of the past. But what I think is the risk right now is inclusiveness. Like that's the real question, right? Like if you go out and you recruit 50-50, let's say, or you get underrepresented groups represented in an appropriate way within your organization, the question I have for businesses and managers and, and board directors is, have you changed the environment by mm -hmm. doing so? Or did you just ask a bunch of people to come in and fit with your culture? And fit, I think, is one of the most dangerous words when it comes to corporate culture, because um, I think fit means sameness. And I don't think that's what we're trying to, that's not the end goal here when we think about diversity and inclusion, it's supposed to be that we change the dialogue. It's supposed to be that we ask different questions. It's supposed to be that we're the creativity that comes to the table. The innovation is more powerful and different than it would be otherwise. And we do know, I mean, I won't take you through it because I'm sure you've read all the studies, but study after study tell us when we better diversity in leadership and around the table, we get business, better business results. And so I don't think we're really leveraging it to its fullest extent, I guess is my point. And so I think it's a really hard one, right? Because it's a soft issue. It's how, as a board director, how do I measure culture within the companies that I'm sitting upon the boards that I'm sitting, right? Because it's, it's hard. You can get people to fill out surveys and things like that, but it doesn't really tell you if when different people come in the door, are they really welcomed? Has the dialogue changed? And are we are creating an environment that really is going to keep those people too? And that's always a good test too, is if you're hiring diversity, is it staying? is one way that you certainly can assess that risk. But we talk about that quite a bit, actually, you know, in some of the, the boardrooms and, and some of the meetings that WCD holds. What should we be doing as directors, right? And how are you really understanding the culture? Because um, we all know talent right now is just there's such a focus on talent. I mean, despite the fact that there's been layoffs in certain industries, there's still a big competition out there for good talent. And oh, everybody's absolutely. trying to track it. So that these softer issues, I think, are the ones that will keep the great talent and create great companies. Yeah. And based on what you're saying, I can tell you firsthand, and I'm sure you've experienced this as well when you were either switching careers or even when you're considering different firms to work for, there's always a reputational component based off of word of mouth, based off of kind mm -hmm. of outside of what we're hearing in the news. To your point, that concept of culture is something that everyone, especially today, is trying to stay on top of because you don't want to go. It, it's hard to be passionate about a role and about the responsibility that you're holding or the work that you're doing if it's not supported properly by your peers or more senior level management. So, yeah, totally. yeah, it's got to be real. You know, a lot of times you'll see companies, it's been, you know, it's on vogue to like have a little slogan at the end of your email about your values. Like, and, and not something yeah. I'm like, okay, that's great, but are you living the values? Is that real? Because a lot of times it's not real. And people are getting very skeptical when, it's, you know, they see something like that and the disconnect and you won't, they'll walk, they'll vote with their feet and walk out the door. So I think it's something that um, good companies are really trying to think about. Like, you know, you make a big, bold statement about diversity or climate. Well, your employees, as, long, as well as your customers, they want to see you doing what you said you were going to do, right? And having the impact that you said you were going to have. Um, so I think it's a lot more challenging to be a manager um, and to be a leader today uh, than it was in the past because all of a sudden you're getting measured on things that, you know, are not just the bottom line. Yeah. No, you're completely correct there. And I guess in lieu of that, how do you see businesses 
changing in the future? I mean, even outside of just the human component, right? Or I guess in addition to the human component, when we think about leaders and diversity and recruiting and talent, do you see there being, I guess, just the way that we do business changing, whether we collaborate more with technology or there's the way organizations are structured um, looks differently. I mean, what are some either observations you had or just thoughts you have in terms of going forward, your forward-looking opinions on that? Yeah, it's interesting. I just had a really good discussion with a group of people um, or in a few different issues, but one of them was business schools. Like, what are we teaching in business school and how has it changed? Mm -hmm. and, and the view around the table was that we need to change the curriculum with business schools. It's got to go beyond what it did when I got my MBA a long time ago, right? It, it, it really needs to take into consideration a lot of things that we've been talking about today um, in terms of broader areas of risk, in terms of sustainable finance, in, in terms of these um, bigger issues in the economy and in, in some, some of the social issues that all of a sudden companies are expected to weigh in on, which they never were before, right? And so what is a successful business? And how do you think about stakeholders, not just shareholders, differently than we did in the past? So I think that, that it, it could start there. Clearly, we can't wait for new graduates to come in to change everything. We also have to be working on it within our businesses. But I do think that, that I think the business world has changed. I, I do think it's real, this focus on stakeholder as opposed to shareholder, and that people have to be really intentional uh, about that. And figure out how you get that real feedback, as we were talking about earlier. Like, how do you reach in your stakeholder base? as a senior leader or as a board member and understand what do they really want? Um, because it can get pretty dangerous in cancel culture, right? Like if you lose yeah. sight of that, uh, all of a sudden you're canceled. And so, you know, it could really hurt your bottom line uh, when you, you do something wrong in the social side or the way you treat your employees or the way you treat the environment and that can have a massive impact on your business. So I, I think business is changing and I think that pace of change will increase. I think technology as well as the other one that, that will have uh, a huge impact because it's moving. The velocity of change from a technology perspective only increases. So I think from that perspective as well, you can't, you have to act a lot more quickly. And a lot of the risks involved with technologies like AI and others are new and everybody's grappling with them and trying to understand them because um, they're huge, potentially huge areas of risk, huge areas of opportunity, yeah. but risk. And so I think we need to assess that as well. So um, all that to say, I think a much more complex environment, no doubt about it, but it's interesting. And I do think that there's lots of opportunity uh, for companies who are willing to think about their business and think about the world and the economy in a different way than we have in the past. Yeah. And I think that's what's so great when we think about this. And when, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, you look to the past and you realize how far we've come and then get excited about, to your point, all the opportunity that exists going forward. Um, so to wrap this up, my next question, I think, will be the most important that I have for you for today. When, Jennifer, is the next vacation that you are taking, given all of the different... <laughs> The roles that you hold. And I know getting time with you, one, thank you so much for making time to be on the podcast today. But two, when are you taking some time off and what are you doing with it? Well, that actually is a great question because my husband and I this summer were saying, you know, we just haven't gotten away in a long time. We've done some stuff. I have six kids. So, you know, we've done family vacations and stuff. But my husband and I are actually going on vacation, just the two of us, to uh, Australia in December. So that's our big vacation. We're very excited about it. And he's never been. I've been before. But uh, but yes, I'm taking a vacation. It's long overdue, but it is going to happen the end of 2023. Awesome. Well, that sounds like some much needed relaxation time, Jennifer, and I'm really excited for you. And I just want to thank you so much for making the time to join us here today on Masters of Risk. I really enjoyed our conversation and feel like I walked away with a lot more insight on being a woman in the boardroom or having a more senior level position, along with just the variance of risk in different segments of the capital markets. And I hope that this was an informative conversation for our listeners as well. And I look forward to speaking with you in soon and having you maybe join us at some point in the future. Well, thank you. I enjoyed the conversation too. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Jennifer. Bye.